Welcome to Sports from the Couch. I gotta say, it's the stupidest thing in sports. With your host, Mike Mercado. Players cannot stand them. Coaches cannot stand them. Most importantly, the fans can't stand them. Brought to you by Mercado Airways. I'm gonna say it once and hopefully I'm wrong, but it's a disaster waiting to happen. That is so bad, that is absolutely brutal. Hello, friends, and welcome into another edition of Sports from the Couch here on Mercado Airwaves. I'm your host, Mike Mercado. I want to thank you so much for making us a part of your day. And on today's episode of Sports from the Couch on this Monday, March 29th, 2021, in the beautiful city of Chicago, we are joined by best friend of the show from Baseball Weekend Journal, MLB Insider, the one, the only, Paul Shivari. Make sure you guys are following Paul Shivari as the MLB season is upon us. We got to talk about some of the mess that is happening in the north and south side of Chicago and some of the biggest news and notes around Major League Baseball. But before we get to that, let's take care of some housekeeping notes. You can follow me all over the universe. I'm on Twitter at Mike and Media, Instagram, Mike Mercado Media, and you can be interactive with the show on Twitter at Couch Sports Talk. Like, rate, review, and shares wherever you get your favorite podcast at Mercado Airwaves. Become a producer of the show and get our interviews ad-free and before anybody else with athletes and celebrities at patreon.com slash Mercado Airwaves. We have swag. Check us out at teespring.com slash Mercado Airwaves. Subscribe to us on YouTube, youtube.com slash Mercado Airwaves Network. Come play video games with us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Mercado Airwaves Network. And if you would like to keep up to date with everything we're doing on the network, from the True Crime Show, the Pop Culture Show, our interviews, our sister podcast, the Gone Missing Podcast, and of course, Sportsman on the Couch, follow us on Twitter at Mercado Airwaves. The one and only Paul Shivari from Baseball Weekend Journal is joining us next here on Sports from the Couch. If you want to keep up with him, follow him on Twitter at Paul Shivari. And you can follow Baseball Weekend Journal on Facebook and on Twitter at Baseball Weekend. Paul Shivari joins us next here on Sports from the Couch on the Mercado Airwaves Network to break everything down as we get ready for opening day in Major League Baseball. You're tuned into Sports from the Couch on the Mercado Airwaves Network. I'm Mike Mercado. Welcome back to the show, buddy. How you been? Man, I've been good, man. It's uh, it's always fun talking baseball to you, but uh, where did the like last month go? I feel like we just did this like yesterday. It's crazy because you and I, we see each other all the damn time over at the uh, station in the city, and it's funny because you and I are always just talking about what's going on in the world, going on in our lives, and this offseason just kind of flew by, and there were a lot of moves, there were a lot of interesting storylines, but... For a winter, for a, a off season that depends on big splashes or whatnot, I thought it was going to drag a lot more, and yet here we are in opening day. Yeah, well, thankfully it is, because I, I love that baseball starts uh, counting on, on Thursday. Yeah, so have you been watching, obviously scouting and watching a lot of it, but have you seen yourself watching more or less spring training this time around than, let's say, previous seasons? Less just because the given circumstances uh, right now in my life, not going to go into it, but um, just it's it's been a good month, uh, um, some some great ups and some uh, minor downs and uh, just been taking me away from the game a little bit. But I trust me, I've had games on. I just throw on random games, random stuff, whatever I can kind of get my eyeballs on. Um, and I also blame the the stupid fighting Illini basketball team for distracting <laughs> me a lot during March. Yeah, and then shout out to Loyola who eliminates them and then gets bounced the very next round. And <laughs> Illinois ends up being the only number one seed who isn't in the Elite Eight. A little local for some people, but <laughs> just not quick. But I watched a lot of Line Eye games. I've always been kind of a fan of them. Um, they were a great team, but unfortunately they lost. But um, with Loyola winning, that was kind of neat to see because I like rooting for Illinois, like uh, in, in the boundary, Illinois uh, colleges and universities when they succeed. And uh, Cameron Crutwig, the uh, star center for Loyola is actually from uh, where I grew up, the, the area. Now, I'm not, not, not in the same town, but the next town over. And it's just really cool to see a kid ball out from the Fox Valley Conference, uh, Jacobs High School in, uh, in March Madness. 
Yeah, so for any of uh, anybody who still has their brackets hasn't been completely destroyed, shout out to you guys because it sure hasn't been like that for your boys over here. But Pauly, what have you thought as in uh, heading into this opening day? Where are your vibes feeling? Are you are you excited? Do you think that we're into a there's because there's a lot of drama going in. And we're gonna talk about it, but your your feelings heading into this uh, opening day, this baseball season. I'm I'm very excited. I think it's it's a little bit uh, tempered compared to past seasons. Um, just, I think because of, we all know that nothing's for certain, um, after what happened last season, but I think the thing that I'm most excited about is the fact that this is a 162 game season. So I think it's, it's going to be a little bit back to a normal feel a little bit back to what we saw in 2019 versus what we saw last year, uh, in terms of a normal nine inning 162 game season Paula you mentioned that we're getting our nine innings 162 and things are heading back to normalcy but before we get into some of the major local news let's kind of hit on that a little bit there are reports out right now talking about just how distant the players the players union and the owners are and we know that after this season we're heading into a union negotiation between the two parties and the reports are now that both sides want a DH on both sides of Major League Baseball, and yet they're not going to do it because there's a lot of pettiness. And it just goes into this, you have a bunch of grown adults acting like children, and I know there's a lot of money on the line, but do you think that there's any type of this black cloud that is going to be in this season? I mean, this is something that's avoidable, but do you think this is just going to be the realization that we're going to be talking about this all season long, this dispute between the owners and the players? Sure. I don't think it's as petty or childish, though, as as, as we need to make it out to be, though. Um, I just think it's, you know, I, I question Rob Manfred as a commissioner. I think this is a really big moment for him to try and create labor piece in, in the game. And that's, that's, I think really one of the major roles of a major league baseball commissioner is, is to really avoid work stoppages and, and uh, you know, d- disputes. And I'm not going to go down the, the Rob Manfred tangent here, but basically mm-hmm. I've, I've been dissatisfied with the work that he's done so far in his 10 years commissioner, but this is, this is going to be a big moment for him mm-hmm. to try and keep the peace. As for Tony Clark, the players union uh, uh, leader, he sometimes he can say things that I think kind of can be um, upsetting to the owners. But at the same time, I think he he's doing a good job of representing the player interests and, and showing that, like, you know, hey, there needs to be some pushback from the players. There needs to be a little bit more of a, a fair opportunity. And, and you know, we, we could talk about that up and down of, of who's at fault and, and to why, but this is going to be a big moment for major league baseball and they can't afford to have us next year at this time staying. Well, when's the season going to start? I mean, are they going to come to, come to an agreement? Um, I was old enough to remember the 94 strike and it was devastating to yeah. baseball. It was very, de- it's still recovering from that moment. It's not the same that it was before then. And it's, it's a turning point. I think right now, anyway, I think regardless of a work stoppage or not, you know, you were talking about the designated hitter being added. I mean, there's going to be some radical changes to the game that we grew up with and enjoyed watching. So I think the most important thing is that Rob Manfred has to keep the peace this year. Tony Clark has to be willing to come to the table. Um, But at the same time, I know Tony Clark would turn that around and say, well, you know, Rob Manfred and the owners need to come to the table too, because, uh, there's been times, uh, especially last year in their negotiation, uh, where the owners just weren't budging on certain things that was just kind of unfair to the players. And, and I think we really need to see, you know, how major league baseball and how the owners, you know, how are the billionaires going to concede to the millions? Mm. That's a sense. Uh, I think the storyline this off season. So what are you feeling then? Like, what are your birds telling you? What are the vibes from the community? Do you think after we crowned a world series champion in 2021, do you think that we're going to go into the owners meetings? We're going to get into spring training. We're going to have a opening day late March, early April of 2022. Yeah, I do. I really do. Um, I think the MLB wields a mighty fist and, if they can promise the money that these players all are already being promised and some, I think um, they, when push comes to shove, they can get this thing done. And, and I think, 
you know, I'm saying this right now in late March heading into opening day, but the summer is going to dictate what that will mean for us. You know, if we see petty arguments, disputes, things like that, that basically, I mean, if you really want to go with the, the highlight of what's going on right now is there's that talk about the all, all-star game getting boycotted due to the Georgia voter laws and this yeah. and that. I don't think that's going to happen, but let's just say that that goes further down the road. That's really going to be one of those moments where the league and the the players union are really going to have a problem. And that could carry over into the off season negotiations. So we are talking about what's going to maybe happen, but we do know that we will have a season this year. And there is a lot of news and notes and best friend of the show, Paul Shavari, is joining us to break it all down. You can follow him all over the universe. He's on Twitter at Paul Shavari. And you can follow Baseball Weekend Journal on Twitter and Facebook at Baseball Weekend. Also, like, rate, review, and share the podcast wherever you get your favorite podcast at Baseball Weekend Journal. So, Paulie, you and I, obviously, we watch a lot of Chicago baseball. And it's been a conversation that has been happening ever since the super stud has been in the minor league season. System. It is the Eloy Jimenez injury that unfortunately happened so close to the damn season. Will be out for five to six months. It's always been the conversation from when he was a Cubs top tier prospect to this very moment of what do you do with him in left field? Should he just be a DH? Let's start with there. Your emotions, your thoughts. What are you feeling after you saw Eloy stretch over that fence and come down with that injury? I think my first thing was, you know, what are you doing? Mm. You know, I, I don't mm. know um, who the outfield instructors are at spring training for the White Sox. I'm sure I'm sure there's some some names that are uh, very, very great outfielders that have played for the White Sox. You know, I think Daryl Boston probably has some insight as well um, as to how they, they do that sort of thing. But, you know, he's he's trying to rob the home run. But at the same time, it, it just seemed like a weird effort. And the way he kind of came off the fence. Um, He's not a great left fielder. He's not a great outfielder. It's really the only position he can play out on the diamond. Mm. He's destined to be a designated hitter soon in this league. Um, Maybe uh, a comp might be like Edwin Encarnacion, possibly. I mean, uh, I know uh, maybe not offense wise, but I think a guy that just ended up sliding into that DH role pretty easily. Um, Right now, the way the Sox are built, though, there's really not a, a spot for mm. him to be a designated hitter. And that, that was the problem to begin with. Um, but on the reverse of that, though, as soon as he got injured, the presumed designated hitter this season, Andrew Vaughn, the uh, the prospect that would be making his major league debut and making that jump above, uh, I think the, the highest he's played is, is high A, um, albeit he played in college, too. So it's not like sure. this guy is... Uh, completely you know new to uh to at least that level of baseball he they were talking about trying out Andrew Vaughn in left field and it was like well if this was always an option why wasn't Aloy Jimenez in the um in the rotation to be a designated here because you're talking about Yasmani Grandal uh, Andrew Vaughn Jose Abreu and amongst others you know there might be you might get a Leori Garcia in there you know a Yoan Mankata on a day where you need to spell him off the field you know who knows what injuries might pop up during the season where a guy can still hit but not field his position who knows but but you're talking about really Grandal Abreu and Vaughn at, at DH this season with Vaughn or Grandal probably getting the the majority of the at-bats so Aloy I think now after this And especially the way he comes back, um, I could see a possibility that he comes back as a DH, even though this really, I don't know how this would affect his fielding because this would be his glove hand uh, with the torn pectoral, the the ruptured pectoral, I should say, um, which is a very freak injury. That's not really a common baseball injury. Um, It's really, the the problem now is not so much how he's going to field his position when he comes back. It's going to be, how is he going to swing the bat? Yep. And so, so you want to talk about that a little bit? So it's a going to be a power injury, right? Like that's what he's going to have to overcome at yeah, this point. As mm-hmm. far as I understand, yeah, that, that I mean, that, I would think because it's like his his um not not the lead in terms of his dominant hand, but it's the one that faces the pitcher first, and that's mm-hmm. like I think where your power comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, you know, so it's it's it's, and I'm not an expert on this sort of thing, but I've seen where uh, it it could affect the way 
he's recovering with his swing. You know, he right. could be feel hundred percent healthy, but you know, are there changes to his swing now and adjustments that he's going to have to make, um, you know, to shorten his swing and make it, make it quick again. So I, I don't know, you know, I, the, they say he's going to be back five to six months from now. Right. So that puts him really right in the thick of a pennant race with the way the white Sox are supposed to be built this year. Right. And you're throwing in a guy in a high leverage situation. If they're really fighting for something to try and get his groove back just in time to play playoff baseball. And, and that's going to be problematic. So yes. there might be a chance that he gets shut down this year. Yeah. You know, I think that's a real possibility. Yeah. It's, I mean, uh, or, or, um, you know, Chicago, this wouldn't be the first time that um, an outfielder that was shaky at his position in the corner uh, gets injured right at about the start of the season and comes back just in time to just DH sure. in the world series yeah. and lead a Chicago team to a championship. He's a That's, super stud. Yeah. Happened yeah. One of the four times that a Chicago team has won Absolutely. the world. Series. It's a hundred percent. That happened five years ago with Kyle Schwarber. Now I don't think this is the, the same exact story because Schwarber had a, you know, the ACL, but the Aloy Jimenez ruptured. It's just such a freak injury. I I'm trying to remain optimistic about it, but at the same time, there's just so many question marks. So it's just, it's, it's just such an unfortunate injury. And it, and it really does, I think, put a dent in the season. I mean, you were talking about a guy that was supposed to get 40 home runs, according to some of the projections. Yeah. And that's, that's devastating to a lineup that needed, not needed, but um, would would love protection for some of their other great hitters, such as Louise Robert, who could use protection in the lineup. Jose Abreu, who yeah, he could use it, but he is still the MVP. So the MVP, might still pay him yeah, MVP. Uh, Yohan Mankata, who you know might be able to turn it on this year after you know last year getting COVID in the shortened season. Who uh, it wasn't like he was a shell of himself, but he definitely wasn't the player. That, that we've seen him in 2019. And we saw a lot of players like that. Now that we have the retrospective of, and the, the hindsight of it, like a lot of players were affected by that 60-game season, not being able to get on the groove or in a, any type of momentum after being injured or whatnot. It, it, I think we can have that perspective. So I think Yohan Mankata will have a nice bounce-back season. I think so, too. I, I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to You know what, Paul? Let me ask you this. Uh, when it comes to the Eloy thing, because, you know, we're mentioning about, like, it's devastating. I think the optimism of it is that he's just a freak. He's a freak athlete. It's 2021. We talked about Schwarber. I think he's two times the athlete Kyle is, and shout out to Schwarber. Hopefully he does great things in his new spot. But, you know, we... I think Eloy will bounce back. I hope he comes back this season, especially if the White Sox are in a true pennant race. But let's like we need to talk about this for for a second. It's impossible to fill the hole that Eloy leaves. I mean, it's impossible, and you're not, and they know that, and they're gonna try their best. Like we talk about Vaughn, and we'll see what happens going around in the market. But will they be in the market? We saw that the the Cubs addressed it, getting a left-handed bat. We've seen that a lot of teams got their guy early. What do you think the White Sox are going to do? What do you think Tony LaRusso is going to do? To replace Aloy Jimenez? Or to put the Band-Aid to get you to the pennant race deep into September? Well, I think the nice thing, just even with the loss of Aloy Jimenez, is the White Sox are deep enough where this sh- they, they still, I think, would have been a contender without, it, like, assuming Aloy Jimenez was never a part of the team mm-hmm. this season. They still were going to be somewhat of a contender this year, or at least a team to, to definitely watch out for. Uh, as far as the band-aid, you know, what, what's Tony LaRusso going to do personally? I mean, he's, he's an anchor. I mean, he's a, he's a total rock. He's a total anchor. Um, good baseball decisions are going to come out of that man because for 30 years, good baseball decisions came out of that man. I don't know how much the team is willing to risk out of the farm system. To Interesting. It's now. I don't think they're going to be in on rental players unless cash considerations or prospects that weren't going to break camp with the team um, or not break camp, but at least uh, make it to the roster. Sure. For instance, let's get like a uh, Micker Adolfo is, is one of those guys that I think what, what's going to happen with him. And if he gets moved in a trade to bring in a guy that was just a rental this year to help them in the playoffs, I wouldn't be shocked at all. Why not? You're you, you Cespedes or you Puig. 
well, you'll see a Puig right now. There's some yes, sexual yes, assault. Yes. Yes. Just throwing it out there there. Why not go for a, a name like that where you know that there is that potential in October to that do something still special? still is a free agent, isn't he? he? I mean, that's that's just one that I haven't seen his name thrown about as much, but he is still a free agent, isn't he? Yeah. Um, he – okay, so it's interesting to me because – when when you throw those two names mm-hmm. exactly at me is um they're both Cuban uh, Yasiel definitely and, and I'm pretty sure uh, Cespedes and and you see the the uh, inflection of Cuban talent on on this ball club uh, uh, Robert Abreu Moncada and, and even just the, the past uh, the the Cuban talent they have the guys that they're bringing in and Yoliki Cespedes um is the half brother of of Jonas Cespedes right. that's one of the national signings from this offseason. and then um, Oscar Colas who is uh, supposed to be signing with them in January. Uh, so when, when, when you talk about all of that, you know, Jose Abreu is unofficially the captain of the squad. He's definitely an older brother type to some of these younger guys like Luis Robert and Yohan Mangata. Yeah, he's the Joakim yeah. Noah of this team. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So he, I want to know his opinion about why, why don't they go get Yohan Cespedes and Yasiel Puig. And I know that's not really his place to share that with the public, but, but I think if I'm the ball club, I'm asking him what his opinion is on that, whether or not I act on that. I think if he has positive things to say, like, yeah, I know, I think, um, you know, Hey, I really think that Yasiel could help us, or I think we could, we could really coach him and mentor him. You know, the guys seem to like him. Um, Then, you know, then I would go and make that move. But now I'm wondering at the same time, they have asked Jose Bray and he said, no, no, that's interesting too. Sure. Yeah. You think they maybe they went that direction and they have already crossed that bridge and they just didn't like the fit? I think so. That's I mean, I, I don't know what goes on, you know, behind closed doors, but, um, uh, you know, I know these teams do their homework and, and I think that that conversation has probably been had between the front office and Jose Abreu, but I, I just don't know, though. Well, that's interesting. And at the very least, we know that they're going to be in conversations. Whether or not they do anything, I think Rick Hahn, Kenny, and Larusa La are all going to be there to be in the market somewhat. And I think they're going to, I think it's just to make your team, you know, bulletproof is to spend that 10 to $12 million and get a big name for this season, go all in. But that's a conversation we can have throughout the entire season. But we are joined with best friend of the show, the one and only Pauly Dangerous, Paul Shivari from Baseball Weekend Journal. And we have been spending some time in the South Side talking about the Chicago White Sox, rightfully so. They are a team that has a chance to win the whole damn thing. But we got to jump to the North Side for a little bit. And Pauly, this one is a very interesting story. We could talk about how Jock Peterson is absolutely destroyed this spring training. That's an interesting kind of way to go into the season, whether that translates or not. Not really going to fo- go into the fool's gold of spring training. We could talk about that as it progresses. I want to talk about this when it comes to the north side. Recent news that no contract talks, even some stalling of contract talks in the middle of negotiations with Anthony Rizzo, Javi Baez, and of course, Chris Bryant. And sources are even saying that Rizzo... And the front office are way off. Some are saying that Rizzo's looking for around $90 million, which is around 70% of what Paul Goldschmidt gets paid. So here we are, Pauly. We're so damn close that by next year, this team will be gutted. What are you feeling? What is what is going on over in the north side? Is this a rebuild? They're just not admitting it? It really feels like it. But, I, you know, not that you have to reward a guy that came and won a championship with you mm-hmm. or, you know, baseball is a business. So, so, you know, we have to understand that there's, there's emotion that gets taken out of some of these decisions, but you would think with a guy like Anthony Rizzo, you don't need to overpay a guy like that, but you would think that you could come to the table and agree on something uh, with that guy. Even if you got to go one year at a time with him, um, I, you know, if anyone in the last 40 years uh, needed to wear a C, on the uniform. I think it's Anthony Rizzo. Um, You know, I think, I think he just really kind of embodies kind of the the fun and the spirit of what that, that 2016 Cubs team was all about. And and I think he really enjoys that the fact that he wears that uniform uh, proudly at the same time, he was a Theo Epstein guy the entire way. Um, Maybe Jed Hoyer more than Theo Epstein, which kind of negates my argument. But I think now that Theo's gone, it's an end of an era, despite the fact that Jed Hoyer remains in in the role of both GM and president of baseball operations. 
so we'll see what happens. They could still sign him next off season. They could still sign him this uh, season, but I know that uh, it sounds like Rizzo doesn't want to yeah. try agree to a contract this off season. Or I'm sorry, this, this season during the season. Um, yeah. I doubt Bryant. I mean, I think everyone agrees that Bryant's not coming back. I, I think yeah, that's people, done. It's getting to the point where I think we would all be kind of shocked at this point. If Chris Bryant is in a Cubs uniform in 2022. As for Javier Baez, I, you know, I think that's kind of weird too, that he hasn't um, done anything, but um, let's see how the season goes. Right. Um, uh, Some people have the Cubs winning the national league central and they're clearly a talented team. However, um, even if, you know, unless they're running away with the thing, Uh even if they're in first place by a little bit, you'd have to think at some point, they're going to start selling pieces to this thing. I mean, you can't let Chris Bryant walk for free. And I don't think Jed Hoyer in, in his role and what he's learned under Theo Epstein and how he operates as a general manager and how the Ricketts family likes their money. I don't think they're going to let an asset just walk away for free. So we'll see what happens, but yeah, it feels like the end of an era for the Cubs. And I'd like to believe that like, this is the, the windows closing, but they got that last shot, but it's like, you know, if you want to talk about a team that's going to have the rug pulled out from underneath them, it's this one. Yep. And I think I've been saying that for about two years now, but the problem was, was last year, we didn't get a full season to see that unfold. They were lucky enough in a sprint that they were able to be the best team in a, in, you know, a, a time where half the league got to go to the playoffs anyway, but you saw once they got to the playoffs, they let a team of kids basically beat them. So, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see what the Cubs do this season, but it's, it's not looking good. And, and, and I hate to be so pessimistic about the Cubs. No, you're just um, keeping it 100. You're keeping hundred percent funky because the bottom line is this, this is a team that has shown us this off season, what they think about the organization, their roster and where they're at moving forward. This is a team that doesn't plan on winning the world series this year. This is a team that's going to try to skate by and maybe win a bad division, but it's totally okay with missing the playoffs. This is a team that's going to be gutted and it's going to pretend that it's not until trade deadline and by the time we know it the only person left standing is going to be Wilson Contreras so like the bottom line is the Cubs have told us what they're doing just like the Bulls locally did recently they told us what they thought about Zach Levine by keeping him and getting him an all-star center by keeping Laurie Markkinen but by trading Wendell Carter you show me what you're feeling and what your organization is doing by your actions and I saw by this offseason what the Cubs thought about this team and it's not good yeah, I mean, the hope is that they just don't let assets walk away for free. I mean, you've got Absolutely. three very talented players all becoming free agents. And regardless of how you feel about bringing them back or not, you know, it's going to turn into something. And, and the hope is that you build for the future. I was one of the few people that liked the U Darvish trade. Yeah, I mean, I understood, I understood why people are upset that you get rid of a guy that still you had team control. And he was at maybe the peak of his career. And that's what you paid him to do. Um, You know, because my opinion when they signed you, Darvish, was that they overpaid him. However, he nearly won a Cy Young award and kept them competitive and became uh, he he grew. He grew into a uh, the potential that that we wanted to see out of you, Darvish, Um, you know, hasn't totally turned the corner yet, even though he's kind of late in his career, but still impressive. And I think arguably worth the money to get rid of him for four guys that are total unknowns at the same time, they might've, they might've won on four lottery tickets. That's, that's the thing. Sure. It's, it remains really be seen. Um, but at the same time, they're gearing up, I think for a payroll dump and a total rebuild and we'll see what they're able to do from there. But um, Hey, Hey, regardless, you know, um, you as a Cubs fan, you got to see your championship sure. um, pressing. I think they really, um, you know, you'll never be able to take the championship away, but you'll, you'll be able to say though, that they kind of, uh, underachieved in a, in a way, in the sense that they really should have been able to win a second one, or at least get closer than they did in 2017. I really think 2018 to 2021 
has been disappointing for the Chicago Cubs. It's going to be um, so interesting when we put that that regime to truly to rest and, you know, when you and I are talking about it because what started off as overachieving what then became, you know, getting to the pinnacle, climbing the mountaintop, being the gold standard, to now being a team that people are looking at when Forbes comes out and says you're worth $3.3 billion, and you see what the Dodgers are doing, what the Mets are doing, these big-name teams, obviously the Yankees and the Padres, and you're over here playing Pittsburgh Pirates baseball, and it's a thing that you and I are going to talk about, and depending on how the rest of these careers of these these, these ball players go, it was an interesting journey, and Paulie, I know we're we're kind of running up against it on this this tradition, unlike any other. Sorry, wrong sport. As we always get ready for opening day here on Sports from the Couch and Baseball Weekend Journal, as we do our major crossover every single year, and of course you can follow the man himself, Paulie Dangerous, all over the universe. He's on Twitter at Paul Shivari, and make sure you're following Baseball Weekend Journal by liking them on Facebook and following them on Twitter at Baseball Weekend. Don't forget to like, rate, review, and share them wherever you get your favorite podcast at Baseball Weekend Journal. Paulie, later on this week, as this is dropping on March 29th, 2021, on a Monday night in the beautiful city of Chicago and all over the interweb, later on this week, you will be doing a deep dive as we get ready for the 2021 campaign in Major League Baseball. We're going to start doing a few quick heads of what we got going on in Major League Baseball, but... Uh, what are you going to be doing? What are you going to be talking about this coming up week? For my my opening day podcast, yeah, I, I will be giving my division picks. Um, I will be giving my playoff picks, my World Series picks. Um, just kind of previewing, um, just kind of some of the the big storylines. Um, you know, just just I you know I love the the whole point of the podcast is just a snapshot of where the world of baseball is at, and this is Major League Baseball's time to shine. It's time to kind of just uh, unveil the the curtain on the 2021 championship season. And uh, I just kind of want to give you my thoughts on how I think it's going to go down. So let's have some fun before we let you go then. And as you give us a true analytical deep dive look later on this week, I want to start off in the NL West. What do you think about that that heavyweight matchup, this Mike Tyson, Muhammad Ali, this Francis Ngannou, John Jones matchup that is the San Diego Padres, the LA Dodgers in the NL West? How are you feeling? I mean, is this is this the hype? Is this going to be the goods? I think so. I really do. Uh, uh, how can you not like that matchup? I think this trumps uh, Red Sox Yankees from the the mid two thousands. Ooh, that's big. That's big. Yeah, I think I think this is. These are some super teams right here. Yeah. Um, the thing that I really got to see though is I, I always question teams' desires to repeat, and it's and it's not so much the heart; it's the you, you know just everything. You know, like do you have the energy? Do, you know, like you you you've tasted it before. So you're not, you're not trying to chase the dragon like you were. Sure. You yeah. Know? Um, you know, I mean, at the same time, you know, it is addictive for these guys to win championships and uh, you know, but it's, it's, it's different, you know, in theory and in practice, it's different. So it, it, for the Dodgers, it, it, it just tells me um, you got pressure, you know, you've got a target on your back. People know that you can win it and you've always had that target on your back, but at the same time with the Dodgers, they're they're the the evil empire they're the, you know they're they're the yankees of the mid 2000s they have always been there and they will continue to be there and even if they struggle they'll find ways to get there so i'm not worried about the dodgers but at the same time i question the dodgers the padres are the ones that have a lot of pressure because they're going all in and this isn't the first time we've seen the padres do this in recent memory if you remember i think 2014 i want to say 2015, somewhere around there, they kind of thought they were going all in that Adrian mm. Gonzalez sort of yes. looking, uh, thing that they had going on there. Um, not the same thing by all means, but, but San Diego went and found a way to figure it out. And here we are right now. Um, it's a, it's an impressive looking team. And I really wanted to pick them as a world series winner. And I'll tease right now that no, they're not my, Oh, world okay. So they're that's going to be, Nope, they're not my World okay. Series winner. While I think they could make it to the World Series, I don't even have them in my World Series prediction. All so. right, so we're going to have to find out when we listen, when the podcast drops at Baseball Weekend Journal later on this week to see who Polly has in the World Series. Moving on, though, to the National League East, I really just want to talk about the Mets. Are they the goods? 
Not yet. Okay. Um, they're still the Mets, but they're, they're a good team too. I don't know where the sudden, hi- I mean, I do understand where the sudden hype came from the fact that now you have an owner that has money and wants to spend money and actually um, an owner that despite the fact that he's probably a ruthless businessman uh, actually was a boyhood fan of the team and actually uh, wants to see this team uh, materialize a world series. So he's willing to do whatever it takes right now to make that happen. However, um, just the fact that they still have a relatively new manager to the game and Luis Rojas uh, kind of scares me. Um, I've never been really sold on Marcus Stroman and I want to see him break out and be the pitcher that people expect him to be. Uh, Noah Syndergaard's injuries, you know, it's an impressive pitching staff, but it's not the end all be all. Um, And at the same time, offensively, it's not a juggernaut like it is across town. While they're a great team, the thing that's really hampering the Mets is the fact that they're in the toughest division in all of baseball. Are they the cream of the crop? Absolutely not in that division. Now, until they prove me wrong, I'm, I'm going to say that. So um, it's, it's definitely an exciting story. They have the best pitcher in the game right now. And Jacob deGrom is their ace, but when he gets injured, which pitchers tend to do, then what? So I'm not going to say that that's going to happen to them. And that's, you know, the deGrom injury is not going to be the reason why they, uh, uh, win this or win, you know, they, they lose this year. And I'm not going to say that DeGrom gets injured this year, mm-hmm. but what I'm saying though, is that I think it leans on too many things that could fall apart easily for them. Now, uh, sometimes you look at a team like that and you say, Oh yeah, you know, they're going to surprise people this year. And it's like, you might be a year early on that 2022, the Mets might be the team that we're talking about. Like we're talking about with San Diego or the New York Yankees or someone like that. I can't wait to hear, though, your thoughts on what is going to be a really fun division between the Marlins, the Phillies, the Nationals, the Mets, and the Braves. And, of course, Paulie will be talking about on this week's edition of Baseball Weekend Journal as we are inching closer to opening day of the 2021 opening day season, beginning for Major League Baseball. Super hyped about that and super hyped to hear your thoughts on our final subject, the final team we'll hit on for this edition, our tradition unlike any other as we get ready for opening day, the New York Yankees. Is this the team to beat in Major League Baseball since the Dodgers might have the the fatigue of winning a World Series for the juggernaut that they've been? Is this the time that the, the awakened giant, the sleeping giant awakens in the New York Yankees? Well, it's definitely the time that the sleeping giant awakens. Are they the team to beat? No. Um, you know, they're, they're an impressive team, but the, until the Dodgers are beaten, Mm -hmm. they are the team to beat. Um, they're they're definitely the ones that you look at and say, you know, that's the target on their back They're They're the power rankings. Number one going into 2021. Right. Um, but at the same time, uh, power rankings, number one, doesn't mean anything. It just means you're the best right now. You're the one right now that most likely looks like you're going to be able to carry it through. Um, I think, that anyone that gets a chance to challenge them could prove that wrong. Um, the Yankees, while they are the American League version of the Dodgers in the sense that, yeah, they, they are power rankings number one in the American League. And until I see something, um, you know, let's let's see. Let's see Giancarlo Stanton regain his form. Let's see Aaron Judge regain his form. If you can get home runs out of those guys all season, I mean, that's. That's huge right there. You got two guys that could potentially put up half of your team's home runs uh, in theory. Um, not like I, I think that's going to happen. Um, but, you know, we need to, need to see Gary Sanchez put it all together one last time. We need to see Glaber Torres step up. Um, you know, we need to see that pitching staff actually be good. And, and the Yankees have always been hampered by their pitching uh, over the last maybe five or six years, maybe even eight years uh one of their problems has been just their pitching staff is just never um going to be uh i shouldn't say never it was always one of those things that was the question mark for them. Mm, mm. so i think i think going into this season i like their pitching staff a little bit more but at the same time the fact that they didn't bring back masahiro tanaka was interesting we don't know what Corey kluber's going to be i mean we know what he's been but we don't know what he's going to be uh, we don't know what Jamison Tyone's going to be, but we know what he has the p- potential to be. We've seen flashes of it. Um, but the, this year could be the year that those guys really put it together, though. Uh, Kluber, I think, might have those injury concerns behind them. Tyone has his health and, and injury concerns uh, behind him as well. 
So, and the fact that, um, you know, they, they may really enjoy this, this new role and relish this new experience being a Yankee. And then the fact that you have Garrett Cole, who's also arguably one of the best pitchers in the game, um, you know, he could put it all together too. So I think finally the Yankees have that starting pitching staff that they've been looking for, for a while. And I think if the offense can really put it together for them and the whole thing can, can just click. Yeah. You're talking about the team to be this season. So um, yeah, I have high expectations for the Yankees for sure. And if you are a fan of the angels, the Astros, the Indians, the white Sox, anybody who has a chance to be a legit contender like the Minnesota twins, and you want to hear more insight like that beautiful, amazing analytic, really deep dives week to week, not just on opening day, you got to be checking out my guy Paul Shivari's podcast, Baseball Weekend Journal, wherever you get your favorite podcast. Make sure you're giving it a thumbs up, five stars. Follow them on Twitter and on Facebook at Baseball Weekend. And, of course, Paul on Twitter at Paul Shivari. Paulie, we did it, my man. We we got to the finish line, and you have a whole lot of work left to do as you get ready for your podcast. But this is uh, one of my favorite podcasts to do all year long. It's getting ready. It's a brand new season and that means spring is here summer is upon us and we got to talk baseball for almost an hour and good times my brother good times it time flies my friend uh we've done this so many times at this time of the year it's just um i'm glad that we're able to uh, put a put a stake in the calendar every year and say yep we we talked about it we introduced it we we introduced the baseball season every season together that's awesome Absolutely, brother. And uh, one last time, when is uh, when is the podcast going to drop as we get ready for the 2021 season? Ooh, um, I will probably release it on Wednesday, the night before. I think Wednesday night before the uh, opening day, uh, let's say 7 p.m. Central. Um, but, you know, sometimes I do things a little early sometimes. So uh, be on the lookout for it, though. Um, check it out. Wednesday, you'll know for sure what all my picks are and where I'm going with everything. And, uh, hey, let's enjoy Thursday, right? Let's uh, crack Absolutely. open a beer, eat a hot dog, eat some peanuts, whatever you do, however you do it, watch some baseball on Thursday. It, it should be a national holiday. It should. You know, all sports should be a national holiday. You know what? We shouldn't have to go to work. That's a different conversation for a different day, though. Uh, and finally, are you going to be doing a normal episode? If anybody's wondering, you do a weekly episode. When is that drop? Uh, I usually drop it on Sunday. Um, it, it varies week to week, but it's uh, it's usually it's usually Sunday that I drop it. Uh, you can find it anywhere, however you listen to your podcast. So uh, what Google, Apple, iTunes, Spotify, uh, all those good uh, stuff. Spotify, Stitcher, all those good things. SoundCloud. Uh, we always do that there. So uh, yeah, it, and it's just always the weekly snapshot. You know, I mean, I was talking about um, you know all of the international uh, series during the off season. You know, someone had asked me at one point in time, it was like uh, November or December, and I was like, I'm doing my baseball podcast. And they're like, baseball, that's over with. What do you talk about? How can you find topics? And it's like, are you kidding? Like, there's like the off season is almost busier than the regular season. Like, there's always something to be talking about in the world of baseball. It's not just major leagues. It's baseball everywhere. So check it out. Baseball Weekend Journal. If you're looking for the most in-depth Major League Baseball, Korean Baseball, and Caribbean League Baseball, you have it at Baseball Weekend Journal. Proud of you, Polly. <laughs> Here, here's kind of the thing about it, though, is I cover a lot of topics. Now, are you going to get the most in-depth analysis on one of those particular topics? No. You know, like, like Dominican baseball, I am not your expert on Dominican baseball, but at least I can point you in the right direction so that you can definitely get your toes wet because I guarantee you, you haven't found the pool. <laughs> With that, homie, thank you for everything. You're the best. I'm proud of you, and uh, thank you for always for, for making this awesome, brother. Hey, you too, man. I really appreciate you having me. A huge thank you to the one and only Paul Shivari from Baseball Weekend Journal for joining us here on Sports from the Couch as we get ready for opening day in Major League Baseball. Follow Baseball Weekend Journal on Facebook and Twitter at Baseball Weekend. Follow Paul on Twitter at Paul Shivari. And share the podcast wherever you get your favorite podcast at Baseball Weekend Journal. And of course, a huge thank you to each and every one of you for joining us here on Sports from the Couch. Don't forget, you can follow us all over the universe. You can follow me all over the universe. I'm on Twitter at Mike and Media, Instagram, Mike Mercado Media, and you can be interactive with the show on Twitter at Couch Sports Talk. Like, rate, review, and shares wherever you get your favorite podcast at Mercado Airwaves. 
Become a producer of the show and get our interviews ad-free and before anybody else with athletes and celebrities at patreon.com slash Mercado Airwaves. We have swag. Check us out at teespring.com slash Mercado Airwaves. Subscribe to us on YouTube, youtube.com slash Mercado Airwaves Network. Come play video games with us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Mercado Airwaves Network. And if you would like to keep up to date with everything we're doing on the network, from the true crime show, the pop culture show, our interviews, our sister podcast, the Gone Missing Podcast, and of course, Sports on the Couch, follow us on Twitter at Mercado Airwaves. Enjoy all the games. Enjoy opening day. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. We will see you next time here on Sports on the Couch on the Mercado Airwaves Network. I'm Mike Mercado. Mercado.